Ja, ja. Ja, Ole. And white people, guys, I want to see over 200. We're getting more people in Jesus' name, and I want to keep increasing. So come on now, invite people. Yeah, yeah. Ole. Ole, ole. Okay, Lord willing, guys, here's my new schedule. Are you ready for the new schedule? Lord Jesus willing. I will be live streaming 4 p.m. between 4 and 4.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So Eastern Standard Time is New York time. That will be my new time for now. Yeah, Magdalene. Yeah, yeah. Magdalene, what did I tell you about your picture? You know, you, you make me melt every time. You know, don't make me chase you in Britain and then ask your parents for your hand in marriage. Don't make me do that, uh, Magdalene. Please. There are other sisters listening. And they're going to say, why is this guy hitting on this woman? Right? Because she's a godly woman. She's beautiful. But her picture kills me. Ah! Yeah, yeah. My name is Olga. Oli. By the way, tonight, God willing, I'll be live streaming with David Wood. Now you see, glory to Jesus Christ. God has blessed David Wood. His channel has taken off. He has about 100 million subscribers. He gets about 1,500 to 1,800 viewers. So pray by the power of Jesus Christ. I start building up my YouTube channel. Remain consistent. Remain holy. In love with Jesus. Not paying lip service. And also that the Lord will give me the health I need. What up, Luisa? Oh, my daughter's calling me. Look. Hold on. My beautiful firstborn. I like the second born. My beautiful baby. Guess what? I'm live right now. So I'm doing her homework right now, so okay. can you wait for her? Well, can you call me back? I'm live streaming. You want me to send you the link? Here, you want to say hi to people? Guys, this is my beautiful baby right here. This is my baby. This is my heart from Jesus. Her? I can't, I can't see. They see you, though. Look, they see your face, okay? Her? Uh, and so this is my Zipporah and my oldest is Sariah. These are my hearts from Jesus. Look how much Jesus loved me. He gave me two beautiful girls and they pray for you. They say, you look like me, mama. Yeah, she makes my face look pretty. Mommy, all over the world, they're watching you and they're praying for you. And Zor Sariah, you know what they're praying? They're praying, Jesus, bless Sariah and Zipporah and Baba and bring them together forever. Amen? Amen. Okay, say, I love you guys. Say, I love you guys. I love you guys. Mm, pray for us. Pray for us. Okay, mommy. I'll promise you I'll call you afterwards. You want me to send you a link so you can watch me? Um, I can I be quiet and say something, please? No, because then my phone is gonna die. It's just what it, okay. but you can watch me on my I'll send you a link, you can watch me and you can comment. I'll send you the link, okay? Is there a charger there? It's far from me, mommy, because though I'm over here because I'm over here. See, this is my bed. And the charger here, it's taken up. I need to charge my computer. You know okay. that after Jesus, who's the most important people in my life after Jesus? Me My angels. I know you miss me, right? Mm -hmm. But are you praying? Jesus, bring us together. Amen? Amen? Okay, and they're praying for you. So let me send you the link and you can watch it. Okay. I love my baby. <laughs> But, but what link on Shrine I'm going to send you on the text message and you click on it. She's so beautiful. She makes my face look pretty. Yeah, yeah. My name is Olga. Hello, Ali. Okay, I'll send it to you. When I send it to you in the text, click on it and you'll watch, okay? Okay. Oh, I Bye. love my girls. Bye bye. Should I hang up now? Yeah, go ahead, mommy. Bye. Bye bye. I love you. I love you more. You see what happens when you do live stream? Uh, Toma and Toma, I wish I was a great dad. I'm going to just let you know. Yeah, George, I just want to let you know. My heart is empty and lonely because I don't have these girls. I haven't actually, I haven't actually touched them and kissed them since June. But I know people. I know certain sisters and brothers, and one of them is here. I'm not going to mention her name. They haven't seen their kids in over 17 years, right? But you can see they're attached to me. Why? Because I used to put them to sleep. They used to wake up with me. And they've been robbed of that. Now, if I keep talking, people are going to say, look at you. You keep bashing their mother. I'm not trying to bash their mother. But I'm not going to hide and cover her sin. She committed adultery. And she's unrepented. And she's committing adultery and fornication with a man who shouldn't be there in my daughter's presence. May the Lord Jesus chase and rebuke her to repent. You see why I'm getting angry, right? See, Lopez, my dear brother, you see this man right here? 
this brother who's an apologist and a preacher, Lopez Media, 17 years he hasn't he hadn't seen his son. Now, my only get angry with their mother because of what she's doing to them. But as far as her and I am concerned, I have no feelings for her. I don't want to hate her. I just want to pray for her that Jesus bless her. But I have no feelings for her. Only time I get angry is when it affects my daughters. But her selfish lust is affecting my daughters. So, guys, can you can you pray for a miracle? Because they're tired. They want to see me. I want to see them. But anyway, let me send her the link. And I'm trying to be open so that we can be a family and I can be honest with you, right? I try to be as open as possible. And they're realizing not everyone here cares about me and not everyone here wants to see me succeed. Some people hate me. And I know sometimes you're justified in hating me because I can be mean. Just ask Magno and she'll tell you how mean I am. Yeah, yeah. My name is Ali. 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 All right, sorry. Hold on. Let me send it to her. Let me just send it to her. You see, God bless me, such beautiful girls. And you know what's probably killing their mom? They look like me. That's, can you imagine you're their mother and you're daily reminded of me because you see my face in them? They're my twins. Right? Daily light. It's because there's a saying in my language, and we're going to begin. Let me share with you. Saying in my language. <clears throat> yeah, they look just like me. I'm not lying. If you look at them, especially my baby pictures. Guys, praise Jesus Christ. He's helped me to lose a lot of weight. And I still haven't lost that 50 I need to. So pray for my success to lose that 50, lean out, and be healthy for the glory of Jesus. Because I've been just maintaining. Hopefully, now I'll take it to the next lever, level. If I show you pictures when I was leaner, right? And I show you pictures of my daughters, you'll think we're twins. But they, they make my face look pr prettier. Now, here's another thing, though. There was a time, believe it or not, I'm not, I'm not like 240s. There was a time in which I was, yeah, her name is Zipporah. Zipporah, the wife of Moses. And my oldest is Sariah. Sariah means princess of Jehovah, princess of Jesus. I deliberately named them after biblical figures to honor Jesus Christ. Now, my ex-wife says she came up with the names. That's another lie she spreads. She came up the names. She doesn't even know the Bible to come up with those names, but that's okay. Let her take credit for that. She did come up with their middle names. Yeah, Sarai. Exactly, Lopez. You spelled it perfectly, man. And Rachel, I do call her Zippy. I call her Zippy Zippers. She just texts me. Zippy Zippers. She goes, Baba, you're best on earth, and I love you. You are the best daughters, and I love you. See, she's lonely now. When she starts texting me, that means they're hurting for me. Pray God will be will make them a fire in their mother's heart to break her of her filth because she just said, Baba, you're best on earth and I love you. So you guys understand why I get angry, right? If I didn't have kids, I, would, I wouldn't be angry with their mother. I'd have nothing to do with their mother. May the Lord bless her. But I got kids involved that she's destroying, even though she thinks she's a good mother and she plays the victim. I don't know. But anyway, sorry, guys. You see, this is the beauty of live stream. Anything goes. Okay, anything goes. And, folks, just let me tell you how real the spiritual warfare is. And, folks, I just want to, again, honor the servant. I haven't given him much time, not because I'm trying to ignore him, because I've been running around my own emotional roller coaster and trying to just stay planted in Christ. Guys, I want you to love and pray and bless Lopez. You see Lopez Media TV. Luis Lopez, pray for his wife who has some health conditions. I posted his prayer request on Facebook. Support his ministry and pray for him. You know, uh, I, I, I just want to say I thank God for this brother and his wife, and I love them. I haven't been able to interact with him much more than I should because I'm in my own world because of my issues. So I want you guys to understand one thing. My daughter said, thank you, Baba. I want you to understand one thing. If I don't respond to you, or if my responses are quick, please don't take it as I'm trying to be rude, disrespectful, look down on you, being arrogant. I do have a lot on my plate, and I'm not complaining. I have a lot on my plate emotionally because I got two girls that are aching for me and asking me, when are you coming? And who are being brainwashed by their mother to think that I did this. Their mother deceived them and told them, that she was having a relationship with that man when we were divorced. 
she lied to them and didn't tell them that she was committing adultery with that man, which is why she divorced me. So she's brainwashing them and lying to them in order to make herself look innocent. You see, this is the problem I'm dealing with. And so what do I say to these girls? If I try to open up to them, she's brainwashed them. She They run to mom and tell them this is what Baba said. And then she sends me text message, which she's not supposed to contact me. So this is a situation I'm in. But I'm trusting the power of Jesus Christ to sustain me and endure to the end. Because at the end of the day, I have to love Jesus more than them. As much as it kills me, Jesus is my Lord, not them. They're a gift from Christ. But we are to focus on the giver and love him more than the gift. And that's what I want in my life. And that's what you want in your lives. Love Jesus more than anything and finish the race by the power of the Holy Spirit for his glory. Okay. Now, just to tell you how real the spiritual warfare is, today I plan to do a session, and I'm going to be on with David Wood. We're going to be on at 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Lord willing. Guess what happened, folks? The attacks are nonstop. I got, I started shivering last night, and I was ill to the point where I thought I wouldn't be able to live stream. But glory to Jesus Christ, glory to our God, Yahovah Rapha, the Holy Spirit has given me enough strength and energy to live stream. Now, pray for me that if the Lord wills, I don't get COVID-19. But if I get it, he gives me the grace to glorify him with it, right? His will be done. But I almost canceled today. So the warfare is real, folks. If Satan can't get you emotionally, he's going to get you physically. The warfare is real. It's not a joke, right? So good to see all of you brothers and sisters. I pray the Lord will keep increasing the viewers and bring in quality people who want to hear and not debate and argue and pontificate. And that the Lord Jesus will anoint me to glorify him. So we love you, Father. Lord Jesus, we love you. Holy Spirit, we love you. <clears throat> Give us the holiness we need to delight your heart and purify us in the blood of the Lamb, the Lord Jesus, and the health we need to glorify Christ and fight for us, Father. Lord Jesus, fight for us. Holy Spirit, fight for us. And we pray Jesus will come sooner than later and that we're covered by the blood of Jesus, sealed by the Spirit, prepared for his return so that when he returns, we are clothed in his righteousness and not be found naked and ashamed. Save us from that, Father. Save us from that, Lord Jesus. Save us from that Holy Spirit and fight for my children. You hear their cries and you love them more than I can imagine. Bring them to me and convict their mother to fear the Lord and to be ashamed of her sin and not to justify it, Father. And bless everyone here, Father. There are people here who also are suffering in some sense, whether physically or emotionally, either they have lost family members or they have family members who are ill, Father, like Lopez's wife. Bless her. Yahovah Rapha, speak healing and life to her body and bless everyone in need, Father. Lord Jesus, wash us in your blood because by your stripes we are made whole. We are healed. Holy Spirit, sanctifies for the glory of Jesus. And Holy Spirit, take over the session. Anoint my mouth to speak truth without error and save me from stammering and confusion. From misinterpretation and bless your people, Holy Spirit, with wisdom and knowledge from your glorious presence. Have your way. Please have your way. Not just in these sessions, but in our lives. Our lives are yours, Holy Spirit. Please make us more like Jesus because we need you. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. Yehovah Father, Son of Spirit. We love you, Abba. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you, Holy Spirit, in Jesus' almighty name. Good to see you. Let me see. Let me tell this guy. I'm going to see a good text. It may have to be after 7, God willing, because I do a live stream with David Wood at 5, and it goes for about two hours. If you can't do it later, then don't worry. We'll do it tomorrow, God willing. I'm live right now if you want to watch me, but I know you're too sanctified and better than me. All right. Anyway. Are you ready now? I wanted to do another session on being born again. Lord willing, I'll get to that this week. So I'm going to try to now start live streaming around 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And the reason why is because where I'm at is going to get really hot. And if I start doing more live streams with David Wood, I want to give myself at least a two, three-hour break. And also, I live with my brother. Pray for him that God bless him and we work together and that he'll give his life to Jesus. Sal, your pal, he's working in this heat. So he comes around 3 o'clock and takes a two-hour nap. So I don't want to be live streaming Around 3 o'clock would be 6 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. So new time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. That's New York time. That's plenty of time for you guys in Europe to come. 
So if I don't see, it's only 122. Come on now. The other day was 270. Don't hurt me. All right. Anyway. Okay. I, uh, let's begin. But real quickly, I was talking to a sister who's uh, from, what is it? Finland? She's Finnish? Finnish? Yeah. Yeah. That's why I said, yeah. My name is Olga. Ole. Ole. Yeah. Yeah. I like that accent, right? All right. Finnish. Finnish. Let's begin. Lord willing, hey, God bless you, Leah Johnson. Leah Johnson, every time I see your name, Johnson, I keep thinking my pastor, my former pastor, Leland Johnson, a godly man. Please, guys, find Pastor Leland Johnson's YouTube channel. Subscribe and listen to his sermons. He's one of the few pastors left that believes the Bible is the perfect word of God, and he preaches it from his heart, and he loves the word. Okay? Pastor Leland Johnson. So whenever I see Johnson, I thought I was her, him. But Leah, God bless you. Lord bless you. Good to see you. Now, I'm going to be <clears throat> addressing the use and misuse of 1 John 5, 7. But are you ready for my articles? Guys, please. And I'd say this not because I want more viewers or more readers, because I want you to be blessed by this material. So let me again remind you, take anything on my YouTube channel, take anything on my website, on my blog, answeringislamblog.wordpress.com, I have about 200 articles, so you have to do a search on various topics, the Trinity, the deity of Christ, the Holy Spirit, salvation, the inspiration of the Bible, refuting Joe's witnesses, refuting Muslims. It's all there on answeringislamblog.wordpress.com and on answeringislam.net. Take all my material. You can upload them to your websites, to your YouTube channel. You can make clips. You have my permission. This material is for you. I want you to understand the material, absorb the material, and share it for the glory of Jesus. Because I promise you, the arguments you're getting from Anthony Rogers, from David Wood, <clears throat> from myself and others, are battle-tested arguments. These are arguments we've used in battle, in spiritual battle. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we've perfected these arguments by the power of the Holy Spirit. And they're indestructible by the power of the Holy Spirit. Not because of us, because the Holy Spirit, who's made these arguments and the weapons that come from him, indestructible. I guarantee you, if you learn the material and know how to present it, as you pray the Holy Spirit enables you, you will destroy every ob objection, demolish every argument, giving a person no excuse not to believe in Jesus Christ anymore. And that's the goal, right? That's the goal. So please... Take these articles. So I've written at least five articles on the Muslim misuse of 1 John 5, verse 7. So I'm going to share that with you. I have a three-part article responding to Bart Ehrman and what he says about 1 John 5, 7 and showing how his claims destroys Muhammad, exposing him as a false prophet, and affirms that the Bible does teach the Trinity and Jesus is the God-man. So let me give you those articles. Are you ready? It's three parts. And God willing, thank the mods. Thank them because they love Jesus. And for the sake of Jesus, they love me and serve me to serve you. Such as Protestant Believer, who beatifies the YouTube channel by putting thumbnails and first and last. And what a gracious brother first and last is. I got upset with him a couple of weeks ago. But in his graciousness and humbleness, he didn't respond. He let me vent. And he forgave me for the sake of the Lord. And he's still here because he loves Jesus. And he knows that I just am an equal opportunist. I like to attack everyone, even people who love me, to show you that I'm impartial. You don't get more impartial than me. I will attack you whether I like you or not. Well, not everyone. There's some people here I like a lot, and I always hesitate to attack them. But they happen to be sisters who love Jesus who are single. So I always try to be nice to them, put on a facade. Hey, girls. No, I'm just kidding. Kidding. Someone's going to take this clip and say Sam is hitting on women. See, it's the Me Too movement, Sam. Don't use your pulpit and platform to flirt. Guys, I'm just kidding, right? So, please, I'm kidding. <laughs> oh, boy. All right, my daughters keep texting me. Yeah, they keep texting me. See, See that tells you they're missing me, right? Can you guys pray? I pray the Lord's Spirit will move you to fast and pray for my daughters. Look, she keeps sending me emojis because she misses me. See? It's hard, man. It's hard. All right, here are the articles. Here are the articles. 
Three-part response to Bart Ehrman's misuse of 1 John 5, 7, part one. And Lord willing, either first, last, or Protestant will put it in the description box when this is done. So that's part one. Okay. Here's part two. Part two. In time, Hayden. In time, daily light. Daily light. I promise you, if I keep being consistent, this is going to take off by the grace of God. We will get a thousand viewers, but it's time. Remember, David Wood has been doing it for over 10 years. He systematically built up his YouTube channel. I'm a Johnny come lately because I'll tell you something. I hate, I hate to see myself and hear my voice, right? Especially when I'm feeling blown it, bloated. Right now, I'm under the weather, so I'm a little bloated. So let me just be transparent. I hate looking at myself and I hate my sound, my voice. I When I hear myself, I cringe. And when I see the way I look, I cringe, especially because I've lost a lot of weight, still haven't lost, lost enough. My head doesn't shrink. Look, my shoulders have shrunk. I need to start hitting weights. But my head is still a huge lemon. My goodness, I look at my head and say, man, if I could chop off my head and still survive, I would lose automatically 60 pounds right there. Look, look, my shoulders, they're narrow. And because my head is huge, it makes my shoulders look even smaller. Oh, Magdalene, I thought you said you too. You can't watch me. It's okay. All right, anyway, here's part two. So that's why I was hesitant, reticent to do videos on YouTube. Because I don't like to see myself or hear myself. I really don't. But now it's not about me, and I pray it's never about me. It's about Jesus. So if this is now one of the most effective ways to educate the body and reach believers, then I'm going to use it. All right. Here's part two. That's part two. We're almost about to begin. Here is part three. I got to give you the articles. Yeah. By the way, first and last, I want to say uh, thank you, Magdalene. Thank you. By the way. First and last, I was going to say, do you hate your your face too, bro? <laughs> my firstborn's listening. So we love you. And when my baby girl, Zipporah, is listening. She goes, Baba, you said you have a lemon head. Yes, mommy, I have a melon head, lemon head. All right, that was part three. So you got the, the three links to my three-part response to Bart Ehrman's comments regarding 1 John 5, 7 and how to turn it against the Muslims. Did you get it? Those three three links to the three part series, because I got two more to give you. Here's the other two. This one is turning the tables, part six a. The three witnesses of First John five seven. This is particularly addressing Muslims. Even my response to Bart Ehrman was addressing Muslims. So here it is. This is now the other series dealing with First John five seven. So that's part one of six, six A, and here is the second part of turning the tables, part six. It's six A, six B, two parts. Six A, six B. Now here's the link to six B. It's all about First John five seven. Okay. So at first last again, I didn't hear you. So you got the links. It's five links to five articles. Alex, if you go to answeringislamblog.wordpress.com and you go back to my archives on YouTube and you go on answeringislam.net, you'll get plenty of homework. Nearly 300 to 400 articles. I haven't counted, but that's how many, right? So first and last, here's my question to you. I was. Does your face like, do you hate looking at yourself first and last? Do you hate your face? Huh? Just curious. Because, man, I was going to say, is it hurting you? Because it's killing me. <laughs> Stop it. Let's begin. Mario. I'm about to block you for saying we shouldn't talk about that. Just kidding. All right. Yeshua, our Lord, my brother, my brother, your name is beautiful. You never put L-M-F-A-O because that's your swearing, man. And I don't say this to put you down because you have the name Yeshua and our Lord. Please do not dishonor the Lord. And some may say I'm splitting at hairs because look at you. You rebuke people and call them dogs. Yes, when they blaspheme and insult and mock my God and come to cause division. I will rebuke them and chasten them. But Yeshua, our Lord, out of out of love as a brother to you, 
You have a beautiful name. Live up to it. L-M-F-A-O. It's bad enough when you do L-M-A-O. Gabriel, L-M-A-O is laughing my aspirations off. But when you put the F before it, it's using the F word. Let me again say it again. As Christians, do not use such vulgar language flippantly. Don't do that. Yusa Borba, God willing, people have told me, and I believe it's from the Lord, that I need to start writing a book. If you guys are praying, God saves me from this corrupt judge and legal system and brings my daughters to me, then I have the freedom. Because right now, I'm still... I'm still not out of the waters, but glory to Jesus. He's on the throne. He'll protect me. Yeah. So please, guys, as brothers, don't use vulgar language, vanity, flippantly for no reason. You're going to say, well, you attack people. I'm attacking people who are blaspheming Jesus, mocking our God, attacking the Bible, and attacking the brethren. I'm giving them a taste of their own medicine and showing them we don't play here. But to just say that for saying it, there's no benefit. If you want to say laughing, do R-O-F-L, -R rolling on the floor laughing, or L-M-B-O, laughing my whatever off, right? But hey, just, just add a love for you. Look, my, da my daughter's again. See, guys? Tell me the Lord's not working because, look, she keeps telling me, Baba, I love you. We love you, Zipporah, and we love you, Sariah, and the people all over the world are praying for you, girls. We're going to be together in Jesus' name. We love you. Haminek. Jerkins. See? She's missing her baba. Do you see why it's hard, folks? You understand? You understand why it's hard to be in the situation I'm in? Two girls are aching for their father. And he can't be there. And he can't do anything because of an evil, filthy, wicked, corrupt judicial system. And they're even now using COVID-19 to pass their agenda using COVID-19 to slowly rob us of our freedoms, to force us to submit to the authority of the government, preparing us for a one-world government. It's, it's happening because scripture cannot be falsified. But we do not fear. We do not worry. We don't panic because King Jesus is on the throne and he's almighty to save and he loves us. And he that is in us is greater than he is in the world. They will never separate us from Jesus. So don't panic. Focus on Christ. All right, now. Well, that said, let's begin. What's the issue? 1 John 5, verse 7. Let's begin. And so again, as we go to 1 John 5, 7, let me remind you. Do not panic. Do not <clears throat> embarrass yourselves and freak out because of COVID-19. Because it's about the glory of Jesus. If they identify you as a Christian... Anything and everything you do will be used to slander the name of Jesus. So let's live in such a way to glorify Christ and show the world you may panic. We don't panic because Christ is risen. He's alive and he's almighty to save no matter what happens. Okay. Do not panic and shame the Lord. Folks, let me just quickly say this. Quickly say this. Historically, Christians have been fed to the lions burned alive, crucified, beaten, imprisoned, exiled for the glory of Jesus. I'm still live streaming, mommy. We love you. I know you miss me. I miss you too. But listen to me, mama. They're, I'm teaching. We're talking about Jesus. Look, we love you. See, girl, guys, they're missing me. You see? I miss you too. We miss you. We love you. Okay, mommy? Let me teach you about Jesus and I'll talk to you. I love you. No, it's okay, mommy. Listen to me because we're talking about you, saying how beautiful you are. Okay. Love you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I said you, you said your head was a lemon. Yeah, I had a lemon head, melon head. They're jerkins. <laughs> jerkins. <laughs> don't make fun of yourself just because your head's big. Do you see what she said? My sweetheart, my baby said, don't make fun of yourself, Baba, because you're handsome. We love you. They love you. Look, they're looking at you. Say, well, I love you. And Jesus loves you. And Jesus loves you. Okay, mommy. And soon, in Jesus' name, we're going to be together forever, right? Mm -hmm. Pray, because he'll hear you. Okay, mommy. Listen to me. Oh, yes, my the doggy doggy. Okay, mama, I love you. I love you. Okay, mama, I'll call you afterwards. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. Hang up. But you said listen to me. 
Yeah, you, but you can listen to me by clicking the link, mommy. Click the link. I love you. Okay, okay. Right, okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Yeah, that tells you that they're aching. Glory to God. Folks, that means God is working. Now imagine if they're aching, what are they doing to their mother? Eating her up. Where's Baba? Where's Baba? We don't want that man, Martin. We want our Baba. So keep praying. And now notice, notice again, guys, why is this happening? Guys, you understand how real the spiritual battle is? Why is this happening? Up until now, I didn't get a call from them. I didn't get a call from them. The moment I go live, I get a call. Because Satan will do anything to distract me. Anything. But Christ is risen. Risen indeed. Let's go to 1 John 5, verse 7. Okay. Let's talk about 1 John 5, 7. The misuse of 1 John 5, 7. Okay, let's go there. Let's read it. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. So focus with me. Help me to help you. Let's focus. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now, this passage is used not just by Muslims, but by anti-Trinitarians across the board. It's even used by Bart Ehrman. And what's the argument? As far as our extent Greek manuscript witnesses are concerned, the existing surviving Greek copies of 1 John that have chapter 5, we do not find 1 John 5, 7 in most of them. And in those places that we do find them, it's either in the margin as a note, and it comes from late manuscripts, late manuscripts from the medieval period. So what's the point? What are the Muslims trying to get you to see? Like the late Ahmadidat, which Adnan Rashid was parroting. Their point is, you see, the only passage, pay attention to the argument, and this is all detailed in my rebuttals. Okay. The only passage that comes closest Closest to articulating the Trinity is 1 John 5, 7. You want me there? The only passage that groups Father, Son, Holy Spirit together is 1 John 5, 7. But due to modern textual criticism, due to the extent witnesses of the Greek manuscripts, this has now been shown to be an interpolation. Follow with me, guys. Pay attention. Send my, my house to the doghouse where his mother is. Send him there, okay? Because he's a satanic distraction, a distraction of the devil. Okay, now, follow with me here. Follow with me. As the Lord Jesus grants me clarity of thought to speak without error, to bless you, not confuse you. Since now, textual critics admit, and the extent, the existing surviving Greek copies of 1 John, that have 1 John 5 demonstrate this was added later. It wasn't something written by John by inspiration of the Holy Spirit. You understand the objection? You understand the objection? You understand what the objection is? Before I move on. Now, Protestant or first class, can you do me a favor? Can you quote either the NIV or the ESV or the New American Standard Bible, their note to 1 John 5, 7? They have a note there. If you have a modern Bible that has notes, they will give you a note about this passage. But you got to really pay attention and pray more people come to learn and benefit and be blessed so that you can see how to use this to your advantage to glorify God and to turn it against the anti-Trinitarian heretics. Okay. Someone put the note there. I mean, I can look it up, but maybe one of you can help me by posting it. There's a note in the modern versions that talk about this passage. That it's an interpolation. In fact, I would say the consensus of scholars that are doing textual criticism in the field of the New Testament text believe this is an interpolation, a spurious passage. It's not genuine. Even those who hold to what's known as the majority text position, they also would deem this passage to be an interpolation. Why? Because in the majority of the Greek witnesses, called the majority text or the Byzantine text. Even in them, you rarely find this passage. Yeah, we know Kwaku. Why are you mentioning him? Don't go into tangents. Focus here. Did anyone post it? Did anyone post the, the notes there? Or do I have to find it first, last, and Protestant? You guys can't do it? Let me know because I don't want to drag too much. Anybody this year? Someone talk to me. 
Someone help me. Okay, here you go. He just posted Andrew Martin. He posted it from the New King James Version. NU means Nestle Alan and United Bible Society's critical Greek text. M, meaning majority, omit the words from in heaven, right? Through on earth, only four or five very late manuscripts contain these words in Greek. Did you catch it? Only four or five very late Greek manuscripts contain. There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. You see that? Did you see the note? Now, that's from the New King James Version. I need something else, but Protestant is taking a sweet time, even though I shouldn't give him a hard time because he is a blessing, and he helps me to help you, and he doesn't get paid for it. And first and last is just looking in the mirror because when I said, do you hate the way you look? Now he's posing in the mirror trying to show us his abs because they're not posting what the notes from NIV or ESV. So let me do it. Okay, thank you. Late manuscripts. Late manuscripts. There you go. Late manuscripts of the Vulgate testify in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. Notice it's saying this is found in late manuscripts of the Latin translation. Okay, so are you seeing what your notes are telling you? The notes to your modern Bibles are telling you. It should be there, but you got to start at 1 John 5, 6, Andrew Martin. Look from 1 John 5, put in 6 to 8. There'll be a note there. They're telling you that this passage, there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, these three are one. That is found in the late manuscripts of the Vulgate. Yusuf, my brother, I love you from a different mother. Pay attention, and guys, please help me by paying attention. Ask the Holy Spirit to help you pay attention because I explain what the Vulgate is. That's the Latin translation of the Bible. Vulgate means vulgar, the common language of the common Latin speaker. The Bible was translated in various languages. One prominent translation is Latin, the Latin Vulgate. In fact, scholars will tell you we have up to 10,000 copies of the biblical books in Latin alone. Latin Vulgate means the Latin translation. Right? And here comes Hater Wood. Look at the devil. Won't stop distracting me. Hater Wood. Tonight I got to carry him. Phone call after phone call, text message after text message. Doesn't stop. Do you see the spiritual warfare? But you know what that means? And David will tell you. Every time we get attacked, we know there's a great blessing waiting if we endure. If we endure by the power of the Holy Spirit, not give in, a great blessing awaits us. I've been, my phone's been blown up and it won't stop. Okay. Sorry. Sorry about that. So, see, it won't stop. Anyway, so are you understanding what the notes are telling you? You understand what the notes are telling you? I will stay strong as you pray for me and fast for me and my daughters. So that Jesus will watch over me for his, for his glory. People are calling me for relevant issues. They're not even in born issues, 19th October. Okay. Do you understand what these notes are telling you? Before I move on, because I got to make the point. You get it now? The notes are telling you that 1 John 5, 7... There are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Spirit, and King James, the Holy Ghost, right? And these three are one, is an interpolation. It's not what John originally wrote. Someone added it later on. If you got that point, we can move on, folks. I pray in Jesus' name it's not complicated, that by the grace of God's Spirit, he'll illuminate us to understand these issues so we can move on. So what is the Muslim trying to suggest? See? Here's proof, number one, your manuscript tradition has been corrupted. And number two, the clearest testimony to the Trinity, the clearest testimony to the Trinity is an interpolation. And the reason why this passage was made up is because the Christian scribes were aware that the Bible doesn't plainly, explicitly teach the doctrine of the Trinity. So they had to come up with something. And added to the manuscript stream tradition 
to give the impression that the Trinity is clearly taught in the Bible. Do you understand the objections now? Do you understand what they're telling you? Two points. Number one, this shows you that your manuscript stream has been corrupted. It's number one. Number two, the fact that someone had to come up with a passage that is the clearest expression of the doctrine of the Trinity demonstrates that the Bible does not teach this doctrine, at least not explicitly. Otherwise, why come up with this passage if it did? J Jacob, brother, we'll give you the links in a minute. Just hold on. Just be patient, brother. We'll give you the links to my PayPal Patreon. Just let's make the point. I don't want you to worry about supporting me right now. I want you to get the information. Now, to be fully transparent, I do believe this is my conviction. I do believe that 1 John 5, 7 is genuine scripture. I do believe it. That's my conviction. Maybe in a future session, I'll give you my reasons. However, for this session, you don't have to argue for the genuineness of 1 John 5, 7. Let me tell you why. Are you ready? I want to teach you how to evangelize and how not to evangelize. I'm trusting the Spirit to bless me with wisdom to speak truthfully and clearly for the glory of Christ and be used as a tool to sharpen you. Okay. Let me tell you how to evangelize, how not to evangelize. It will be a waste of your time trying to get someone to believe in the genuineness of 1 John 5, 7. Because number one, those who bring up this passage are not interested in believing in the Trinity for the most part. For the most part. Those scholars that do believe in the Trinity reject this passage not because they reject the Trinity. It's because they're not convinced it's genuine. So we'll put them aside. James White, Daniel Wallace, William Lane Craig, these men who are Trinitarians and love the Trinity, they don't reject it because they don't believe in the Trinity. They reject it because they don't think the evidence is sufficient to show John wrote it. So we're going to put that gr group on, on the side because that same group, will tell you the Bible does teach the Trinity from cover to cover. So we'll put them aside. What we want to deal with is the group that raised this passage to attack the Trinity and attack the veracity of the Bible because they're not interested in believing in the Bible or in the Trinity. That's the group I'm tar targeting. That group includes the Bart Ehrmans, the Adnan Rashids, and even Bart Ehrman doesn't really fit in that group. But again... Right, the Ahmadidats. That's the group I'm targeting. So I want to share with you how to witness to that group and how not to witness to that group. Okay, are you ready now? With that as the background, I want to go into the meat of the matter. And Lord willing, hopefully tomorrow I can get back doing being born again. Tomorrow, God willing, I'll do a topic on being born again, and we'll go back on Jesus being worshipped as God. Okay, so if you get that, and I hope Lisa's here, right? So even for 1611, my dear brother, who believes that's as genuine like I do, don't waste your time in trying to prove it's genuine. You're wasting your time. So what do I do? Here's what I do. I turn it against them. Are you ready now for me to show you how to turn it against them? Because that's the, the point. That's the point. And by the way, they don't realize that this argument that says that 1 John 5, 7 is not genuine, actually assumes the Bible's preservation. Let me make that point real quick, clear. That actually is an argument for the Bible being preserved by God. Why, why do I say that? How would you know that something's an interpolation if you don't know what the original says? How can you tell me this is not genuine if you don't know what the genuine says. So they don't realize in saying that, they're actually proving the Bible's veracity and preservation. But in their blind hatred of God, they don't see how that argument destroys them. And their assault against God's word. So my question would be, hold on. It's an interpolation? How do you know? If the manuscript tradition wasn't sufficient to tell us what the Bible originally read, so that every original word that God inspired is preserved, in the mass, massive amount of the manuscript tradition, how would you know this is an interpolation? God bless you, Aaron. See, even Andrew Martin, who professes to be an atheist, but in his heart he loves Jesus and can't get enough of Jesus, 
and wants to see Islam destroyed, right? Even he, notice what he just said. That means the Bible's preserved, not corrupted. You catch it? Even he sees it. Even a Bart Ehrman, who tries to make the variant readings much worse than they appear, even Bart Ehrman acknowledges that the original wording is there. You know how I know Bart Ehrman believes that? Exactly, Alex. You'll find a YouTube video where Bart Ehrman says, the doctrine of the Trinity is not based on 1 John 5, 7. And it's even on a clip where he's being interviewed by a Muslim, and he says, no, 1 John 5, 7 doesn't refute that the Trinity is not in the Bible because the Trinity is a doctrine that you arrive at by looking at the Bible as a whole. And that's in a clip by a Muslim interviewing him about 1 John 5, 7, which you can find on YouTube, which backfired against the Muslim. You'll find it. Put Bart Ehrman, Muslim, and Trinity. Embarrassing to the Muslims, and they don't see it. He goes, no, the Trinity is not based on 1 John 5, 7. It's based on what the Bible teaches as all. He even says it. Now, let me give you further proof that Bart Ehrman assumes that the original wording of the authors is preserved and not lost. You know how I know he believes that? How I know Ehrman believes that even though he takes the few variant readings and makes them much bigger than they are? Do you guys want to know how I know that? And this has been noted by other Christians. I'm not the first. Okay, you know how I know that? Because anytime Bart Ehrman writes a book on the origins of Christianity or writes a book on what the historical Jesus taught or writes a book on Paul's theology, he's assuming that the New Testament documents accurately preserve what was originally written in order for him to know what Paul believed and what Jesus said and what the apostles preached. Otherwise, how can you write books on what Paul taught and what Paul did and what Jesus did and what Jesus preached and what the apostles proclaimed if you don't have a faithful replica of the originals? Right? So when he writes a book about the historical Jesus proving that Jesus existed, but Bart Ehrman, how do you know? Oh, because we have documents recording the life of Jesus, even though not everything in those documents are true because they embellished. But still, by applying the historical method, we can determine what parts of those documents Jesus said and did and what parts were just made up by the authors. But wait, Bart Ehrman, for you to know that the author wrote this about Jesus, that means you assume that what he wrote is still preserved. Right? And he'll tell you that Paul believed that Jesus is the God man because Paul wrote this in Romans. And he wrote, uh, uh, Dr. Ehrman, so you're telling me when you read Philippians chapter 2, the Carmen Christi, you know for a fact Paul wrote that? Yeah, but how do you know that if the manuscript stream is so corrupt that you cannot trust that you'll find what they originally wrote in that stream? You catch it? So the very fact he writes books on the origins of Christianity, on the historical Jesus, on what Jesus' followers believed and taught, shows that he himself believes that what they wrote has been preserved and that you can get back to what they originally wrote, right? And therefore can determine what their beliefs were. You catch it? Evangelist Stephanie, you are false, and your parents are false for deceiving you and thinking you're human. What a stupid question. Is the Trinity false? Okay, but you with me there? So Ehrman is not a friend to Muslims. Ehrman will tell you as a fact of history. Okay, he'll say, it is a fact Jesus was killed by the cross. Fact. He will also say, it's a fact that some of Jesus' own followers, and he mentions two, Peter and Mary Magdalene had visions where they saw Jesus alive in his physical body in heaven, reigning as God. And then he says, it is a fact that Paul also had a vision that convinced him Jesus is alive in his physical body, 
because he had been raised in his physical body and he rules in heaven as God. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Ehrman. How do you know these are facts? And that's what Peter believed and Magdalene believed and Paul believed. If the manuscript tradition is so corrupt, we don't know what they originally wrote. You see the point now? Yeah, Bart Ehrman was an evangelical Christian sargon who went to Moody Bible Institute, went to Wheaton, and then Princeton and lost his faith in the Bible and now has become an agnostic slash atheist. Okay, so you with me there? He's world renowned. So you see how Bart Ehrman actually proves the Bible has been preserved. Otherwise, why are you writing books on the historical Jesus, on the apostles, and what they taught, what they believed, and what they did, and what they encountered? So Bart Ehrman is not, uh, doesn't help Muslims because Bart Ehrman is admitting Jesus' own followers, Peter and Mary Magdalene, which the Quran says were Muslims, believed God raised Jesus physically, bodily, after he was killed on the cross, and Jesus now reigns from heaven as God, and he died for our sins. That's what Bart Ehrman says. Jesus' followers who knew him were preaching and believing and were willing to die for that claim, all of which means the Quran is a lie and Muhammad is a false prophet. So Muslims, you want to keep using Bart Ehrman? You want to keep using Bart Ehrman? You with me there? So let's put Bart Ehrman aside. Now, when a Muslim quotes 1 John 5, 7, he is not interested in hearing your arguments for the manuscript support for 1 John 5, 7 or the lack thereof. He doesn't care. He doesn't care what the Bible teaches. What he's trying to do is get you to doubt the inspiration of the Bible and get you to doubt that the Bible teaches the Trinity. So that's the group I'm going to refute and show you how this argument backfires against them. Are we now ready? Are you now ready? How do I turn this argument against them? So number one, don't argue for its veracity or lack thereof. Just go with it. Like I did in my live stream with David Wood. I go, okay, I'm going to agree with Adnan and his group of textual critics. I'll assume it's not genuine. Go with it. Don't waste your time. Expo expose a fool and answer a fool according to his folly. Proverbs 26, verse 5. Stoop to his level. Answer a fool according to his foolishness to show how stupid and dishonest he is. That's what I'm doing now. Proverbs 26, verse 5. Okay? That's what I'm doing. So I say, number one, you're saying, because the text says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. That means they're one in essence? You'll say, yes, see, they're one. And the oneness there proves that they're one God. But we know it's an interpolation, so it's no support for the Trinity. You getting it? Okay, so that's the argument. Because it says they are one, that means they're one God, and therefore it would prove the Trinity, but we know it's an interpolation, and you can't use it to support the Trinity. I go, okay, you sure? Yeah, because that's his position. David Wood it, believes what Daniel Wallace, James White, others do, because, again, among the members of the apologetic team, we have different views when it comes to the text of the New Testament. We take different positions, right? He would follow, and vocab would follow what's known as reason eclecticism. That's fine. That's okay. I don't make you know, we're, because we still believe the Bible's been preserved, and that when we pick up the Bible, we can know what God inspired to the original authors and through the original authors. Now, put put that aside, Ariel. That's in my articles and in my sessions. You you see where I'm going with this. So Ariel saw it. You see where I'm going with this. Okay. Here's where I'm going with this. So when you say that this proves the Trinity, you're arguing on the basis that it says the Father and the Word and the Holy Ghost, Holy Spirit, these three are one. So it's that phrase one that shows that this is a text for the Trinity. They'll say yes, but it's an interpolation, so it doesn't support the Trinity. Thank you for now destroying Islam, exposing Muhammad as an antichrist, an agent of Satan, and exposing the Quran as a satanic fraud, and exposing your inconsistency.
And they'll say, what do you mean? You just proved that Jesus claimed to be God. Because in John 10, verse 30, Jesus says, I and my Father, we are one. So according to you, that should now convince you that Jesus taught he is one with the Father, and therefore he's God in the flesh. John 10, verse 30. Thank you. Thank you. And that's what I do in those articles I sent you. That's what I do. It's not buffering, world changer. Refresh your computer, dude. Did you catch it? Let's go to John 1030. John 1030. Let's look at it. I and the Father are one. Now, let me show you what the word R is in the Greek. You don't need to read Greek, but I still want you to see, because this affirms two facts. Jesus is not the Father. They're not the same person, destroying the heresy of modalism. And secondly, Jesus is one with the Father in divine essence and, and power. I'll prove that to you from the context. Okay, here you go. Here's the link. You don't need to read Greek to see what the Greek says. Here you go. I want you to see that the verb for R is esmen. Esmen. Okay. Now, tech boy, you know the Greek. All right. Esmen. Right? It's ego, ke, or kai, if you want to say it the Erasmian way. Ego, kai, hapater, hen, esmen. One, we are. The verb esmen is plural. Literally, it's we are. So notice two facts from John 10.30. Esmen, we are showing Jesus is not the Father. Jesus is not the Father. That's why he uses the plural verb, we are. So they're two distinct persons, but he's one with the Father. One in what sense? Now remember what the Muslim argument was. When it says there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. One here means they're one God. The word there, one, means one in essence. Oh, but Jesus said he and the Father, both of them are one. You just proved that Jesus claimed to be God. And there are at least two persons of the Godhead, Father and the Son. Mark, if you're going to play the devil's advocate, you're not going to bounce you, right? Mark, you understand your comment is a stupid one because I'm going to refute it. But you're trying to play slick with me. I'm going to bounce you for that. The contexts are not different because in John 10, Jesus is saying he's one with the Father in essence. Whereas in 1 John 5, the oneness is not in essence. It's in their testimony. So why are you trying to egg me on thinking you're smart and waxing eloquent when I'm going to embarrass you, friend? Why are you doing this? Why are you chiming in and waxing eloquent, not being patient to show you how I'm going to turn this against you? Because again... You're putting this in the words of the Muslims, but it's actually your objection, and you're lying through your teeth. Give me the name of the Muslim that says it's a different context. Give me the name of the Muslim that says it's a different context. Mark, give me the name of the Muslim that says it's a different context, because you're lying through your teeth. You're putting words in their mouth, because that's your objection. Okay? Okay. Give me the name of the Muslim you heard that it says it's a different context. You got 10 seconds. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2. Send them out of here, you wicked liar. You're trying to come up with an objection and pretending the Muslims brought it up. Snake. You don't have the guts to say it for yourself. So you put in the words of the Muslims. Okay. I'm going to get to that. Folks, let me remind you of the, of the rules again. Don't pontificate. Don't be a smart aleck pretending to be putting an objection in the mouth of the opponents when it's your objection because you're not going to last. You want to benefit? Help me to help you. Listen. Stop pontificating because I'm going to get to that. Now, let me address that response. If they tell you the contexts are different, okay, they are correct. The context of 1 John 5 is different from the context of John 10, but it backfires against them. Do you know why? 
Do you know why? Because in the context of John 10, Jesus is saying he is one with the Father in essence. Whereas the context of 1 John 5 has nothing to do with essence. Are you now ready for the second part of my objection? Yeah, King of Kings, I've been around a lot longer. And I know when a snake is trying to use an argument to try to refute me. Right? I don't think your father would agree with you that you're one with him because he wants to disown you and deny you, tech boy. I don't blame him. All right. I wasn't born yesterday. I was born the day before. All right. Now, let me repeat the point again. It is true. The context of John 10 is different from the context of 1 John 5. But here is where the Muslim ends up destroying himself. In John 10, Jesus is clearly one with the Father in essence. Whereas the oneness of 1 John 5 has nothing to do with essence. So are, not, are we now ready to unpack and send Joshua to the doghouse where he was born in? Get this dog out of here. All right. Are we ready now? Are you ready now? See, now the demons are manifesting. No, I won't do any end teachings on end times and rapture. No. I'll do it when I get rapture and leave you behind. Let's go to John 10, 27 to 30. Yep, and that's from Robert Morey, Evangelifish. He's right. I don't play games. It's not time to play games, folks. We're not here to play games and just to butter up each other. It's okay, brother. I hurt you. I'm so sorry. The only one I will be nice to and butter up is Magdalene. Everyone else, I'm going to tear you to shreds. All right, John 10, 27 to 30. Okay, let's read. My sheep, listen to my voice. Guys, I need your undivided attention by the power of the Holy Spirit for the glory of Christ. My sheep... Listen to my voice. Pay attention. My sheep, my voice. I know them and they follow me. Second thing I want you to pay attention. I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. So pay attention. Jesus says, my sheep, my voice, in my hand, and I give them eternal life. So these four points. My sheep, my voice, they're in my hand. I give them eternal life. My father who's given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my father's hand. I and my father are one. Everyone with me there? Did you catch it? The four points I want you to note from what Jesus said. My sheep, my voice, in my hand, and I give them eternal life. And no one can pluck them out of my hand. No one can pluck them out of my father's hand. Why? Why can't anyone... Pluck the sheep from us and destroy them. No one can pluck the sheep out of my hand and destroy them. And no one can pluck them out of the hand of my father and destroy them. Because we're one. One in what? In our divine ability to preserve the sheep, guaranteeing their physical indestructibility and moral incorruptibility. Okay, now, let me show you what Jesus just claimed for himself. My sheep in my hand, hear my voice, I give them eternal life. Psalm 95, Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Psalm 95, verses 6 to 8. See, my daughter saying, are you done yet? No. Let's read. Mahdi, I'm going to bury you and your prophet with John 17, 21. Don't run, coward. And I'm going to have you call me now on Skype so I can humiliate your prophet for being stupid to quote John 17, 21. Guys, do you want me to use Mahdi as a taste, uh, case study? You want me to embarrass him and his prophet? Because he made the stupid mistake of quoting John 17, 21. Mahdi, call me. Let me use you to embarrass your prophet for producing people like you. May you repent from this wicked pedophile, Muhammad. There goes my name. Benny underscore Malik 3. Call me right now. So I can use you to embarrass Muhammad, this agent of the devil, for creating people like you who can't think critically. And I'm going to use John 17, 21 to embarrass your prophet. Are you going to call me? We're waiting. Are you, you going to call me? Because I'm going to use you to shame Muhammad. You don't have Skype. Okay. Guys, let me now deal with him in the text. Hold on. Let me deal with him in the text. Guys, help me to help you. Don't text because this coward won't call because he's embarrassed of his prophet. Okay. Now. <sighs> Mahdi, do you believe... That Jesus Christ gives eternal life to all believers 
and that all believers are in his hand, like they're in the Father's hand, and no one can pluck a believer out of the hand of Jesus like they can't pluck out of the hand of the Father. Do you believe that? Don't waste my time, you coward. Okay, so you don't believe what Jesus just said in John 10, 27 to 30? We just quoted Jesus saying, they are my sheep, they're in my hand, they hear my voice, no one plucks them out of my hand. They're a hand in my father, no one plucks them out of my, in my father's hand. So you don't believe what we just quoted? You don't believe what we just quoted? Did you catch it now? Did not he didn't he just prove to me 1 John 5 7 doesn't matter if it's true or not because these wicked sons of Satan, like their dog Muhammad, don't care about truth. No, Mahdi. My belief shows that your prophet is a son of Satan because you believe that Allah is the father of Jesus and Jesus is his son who's one with him. Do you believe that, Mahdi? That Allah is the father of Jesus and Jesus is the son who's one with them, one with him. No. Okay, now get him out of here. See? He just proved my point, folks. No, get him out of here. That's it. He just proved my point. What was my point? Thank you, Jesus, for bringing this Muhammad in to prove my point. What was my point? They don't care about what the Bible says about the Trinity, and they don't care whether a passage is genuine or not, because even if it's genuine, they'll explain it away because they don't care. They're just doing that to attack you. Did he not just prove my point? I quoted Jesus saying, I'm the Father One, and he explained it away by going to John 17, 21. What more proof do you need, folks, that this is the way you need to argue with Muslims? What more proof do you need that this is the way you need to argue with Muslims to shame them, humiliate them, and their wicked, filthy prophet for creating a people so dishonest and wicked, deceitful, with a lust to murder and to commit sexual morality, unless and until Jesus sets them free. Okay? So now going back to the issue, going back to the issue, Hayden, can you help me by not helping me and not chiming in, brother? Why are you quoting John 17, verse 5? What has that got to do with John 10? Brother, can you help me by not helping me? Because, you know, I love you, but not too much. All right, now let's focus. Remember what Jesus said? My sheep... Hear my voice. I give them eternal life. No one can pluck them out of my hand. They're my sheep. They're in my hand. They hear my voice, and I give them eternal life. My sheep in my hand, my voice, I give them eternal life. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Pay attention now. Doing God's work. Please don't help me by quoting irrelevant passages. Please. If you want to last year, just sit and listen. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Come, let us bow down in worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture. The flock under his care. Why in the world is this guy quoting to me some other translation? That doesn't translate literally, but paraphrases instead of the King James. I'm not cut out for this. I'm not. Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. For he is our God. We are the people of his pasture. And the sheep of his hand. Do you see why I got upset at the translation he quoted? He quoted a translation that paraphrased the Hebrew. The Hebrew says, the sheep of his hand. We are the sheep in God's hands. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your hearts. Did you now see why I wanted him to quote a little translation? Psalm 95, 6 to 8. Psalm 95, verses 6 to 8. One more time. Pay attention. Why? The literal translation of the Hebrew is important, or you're not going to make the connection with Jesus. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, Jehovah, our maker, for we, for he is our God. We are the people of his pasture. 
The sheep of his hand, today, if you'll hear his voice. Did you see how it ties in with Jesus? Do you see how it ties in with Jesus? The sheep of Jehovah's hand, and we are to hear his voice. Jesus says, they're my sheep in my hand, and they're to hear my voice. That's number one. Number two, Deuteronomy 32, 39, because Manuel Flores is not patient. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Ron here is not patient either. These guys are excited. Sam, I want to show you. I know these verses too, Sam. I know them too. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Can I get a brownie point? Okay, Deuteronomy 32, 39. See now that I, even I, am he. And there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. Let's post Deuteronomy 32, 39 one more time. Okay. See now that I, even I am he, there is no God with me. I kill and I make alive. I wound and I heal. Neither is there any that can deliver out of my hand. So I, Jehovah, alone am God. I alone make alive and no one can deliver out of my hand. Believers are the sheep of Jehovah's hand. They are to hear his voice. Jesus comes and says, they're my sheep in my hand. They hear my voice. And I only, not only give them life, I give them everlasting life. Is there any doubt that in John 10, 27 to 30, John 10, 27 to 30, Jesus just claimed to be one with the Father in essence, in power. Therefore, he's claiming the Father and he are God. Because Jesus is now claiming to do what the Old Testament says only Jehovah can do. You get it now? Isaiah 43, verse 13. Isaiah 43, verse 13. Ah, oh, my, my daughter. I'm not done, Zipporah. I'm almost done. Okay, tell mommy. Mommy, enough Martin. Get him out of our life. We want Baba. So say, mommy, we want Baba, not Martin. Get him out of our life. We want Baba. Because I love you girls. You love me. In Jesus' name. All right. Isaiah 43, 13. Yea, before the day was, I am. Yea, before the day was, I am. There goes the dog, Muhammad a dog again on another nick. Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? One more time, Isaiah 43, 13. Yeah, she's listening, Mickey. She goes, I don't understand the sheep. Isaiah 43, 13. Isaiah 43, 13. Yea, before the day was, I am he. There is none that can deliver out of my hand. I will work, and who shall let it? So now, let's review what Jesus said. My sheep hear my voice. I give them everlasting life. They shall never perish. No one can pluck them out of my hand. My sheep, my voice in my hand, I give them everlasting life. Jehovah says that we are his sheep in his hand, his care, his protection. He makes alive and none can deliver out of Jehovah's hand. Why is Jesus speaking as if he's Jehovah God? Why is he taking the language of the Old Testament? Language used only of Jehovah and applying it to himself and also to the Father. No one can deliver out of the Father's hand if Jesus is not claiming to be the God-man. May the Lord Jesus have mercy on you, Sophia Brown, and your 10-year-old son, and save him from immorality and agents of the devil. You got it now? So is it clear proof that in John 10, 27-30, Jesus saying, I and the Father are one in essence, in power, in ability, because I can do what only God does, and the Father does what only God does, because the Father and I are God, which is why I can take what the Old Testament says about Jehovah and apply it to myself. So what they said about Jehovah, Jesus said about himself. That's why in John 10, 31 to 33, the Jews who knew the Old Testament knew what he was saying. They, at this, they picked up stones to stone him. And then Jesus said, many good works I've shown you from the Father. 
For which of these do you stone me? And then 33 they say, For a good work we do not stone you, but for blasphemy. And because that you, being a man, make yourself out to be God. We know this is the language of Jehovah. Only Jehovah can do what you claim you can do. And this can only said about Jeho Jehovah. But you're a Jewish man, and you're claiming the things that only Jehovah can do. And yet you're not the father. You're the son of the father, and you say you're one with him. So you're saying you're God too? The God man? A man who's God? But you see how I just call their bluff. I just called Ahmad Didad's bluff. I just called Adnan Rashid's bluff. I just called the Mohammedan bluff. You know why? Because when we show them John 10.30, now it doesn't mean that Father and Son are one God. Did you see it? No, it doesn't mean that. Go to John 17.21, where the disciples are one as the Father and Son are one. Oh, wait. So in John 10.30, because it's not textually disputable, there is no manuscript that you can point to to show this has been added. John wrote John 10.30. It's part of what John wrote by inspiration of the Holy Spirit and preserved in the plethora of the manuscript stream. So you can't say it's been added. Since you can't say it's been added, now you have to explain it away. You see their wicked dishonesty? Do you see their wicked dishonesty? Louisa, 1611, have you seen it? If they can't refute the passage being genuine, then they'll say it doesn't prove that Jesus is God. But if they can show it's not genuine, it's been added, yeah, that's proof of the Trinity, but it's an interpolation. You see, they truly are of their father, the devil, which is why I cannot stand this religion. I hate Islam and Muhammad from the core of my being because Muhammad was a son of Satan who deceived these people, but Jesus is almighty over Muhammad and the demon if it wasn't Satan that inspired him and made Jesus give the Muslims eyes to see and set them free from such a wicked, evil, deceitful, conniving, lying, murderous religion. You understand what I just showed you? You understand what I'm showing you how to debate and how not to debate? To expose their lies and their seed, showing they are of the devil. Until Jesus sets them free. So we pray God sets them free. You see when they can't explain John 10, 30 away as an interpolation. Then they say it doesn't prove that he's God. But if they can explain away a passage as being added to the manuscript stream. See that's proof of the Trinity but it's an interpolation. <laughs> oh but John 10, 30. Yeah that is generally what John wrote. It's part of the inspired gospel of John. But it doesn't mean Jesus is God. And even if it did, who said Jesus said it? They don't care about truth. You see my point? They don't care about truth. Since they can't attack John 10.30 as being something added to the manuscript stream, they'll say, well, Jesus didn't say it. John made it up. John is lying. He made it up. Or if he said it, it doesn't mean he's one with the Father in essence. Therefore, it's not saying Father and Son are one God. But wait, didn't you tell me in 1 John 5, 7 that when it says there are three that are in heaven, the Father, the Word, the Holy Ghost, and these three are one, there one means one God? Why is it over here it doesn't mean one God? When the context is clear, he's saying that he's one with the Father in his power and ability to do what only Jehovah can do, proving they are one God. So the one God is at least two persons, father and son. Who's not getting this point? Who's not getting this point? Now, sorry to burst your bubble. Now I'm going to show you that 1 John 5, 7, even if you take the passage as being genuine, like I do, even if you take the genuineness of the passage, it's still not referring to the Trinity. Remember what I said? John 10, 30, 1 John 5, 7, there are different contexts. And yet, in the context of John 10, 30, it is a proof that the Father and Son are two divine persons who coexist as one God. 
But in the case of 1 John 5, 7, it is not a proof text of the Trinity. Can I prove that to you? Can I prove that to you? 1 John 5, 7 is not about the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit being one in essence. This is why we have to read context, folks. Context. Context. Let's see what John meant when he said they are one. Okay. Let's go to 1 John 5. Let's read verses 6 to 8. Let's start with 1 John 5, 6 to 8. Irony of ironies, isn't it? 1 John 5, 6 to 8. Hayden, why are you engaging someone in a talk that's irrelevant to our point so you can be distracted? 1 John 5, 6 to 8. Let's read. This is he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness. Pay attention what the context is. Bearing witness, testifying in regards to a matter. Pay attention. The spirit beareth witness because the spirit is truth. For there are three that bear record, bear witness in heaven. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost, and these three are one. Now verse 8. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit, the water, and the blood, and these three agree in one. Now you understand what the context is? We're going to read 9 and 12 in a minute. The context is of multiple witnesses. What John is doing, he's appealing to the law of Moses that says you need at least two or three witnesses to confirm something as true. You need two or three witnesses. So he's saying, you got that. You have three witnesses who agree as one. Their witness is one and three witnesses on earth. In other words, it's saying they are one in respect to their witness. They are united in their witness. They are one in regards to their witness, not essence. The passage has nothing to do with essence. It's just like verse 8. The spirit and the water and the blood, these three agree in one on earth. But the spirit is not the same essence as water, and water is not the same essence as blood. It has nothing to do with the essence of the witnesses, but their agreement. So even if it's genuine, and I believe it is, it's not referring to the essence of the Godhead. And yet, John 10.30 is referring to the common essence that the Father and the Son share. Leila Rana, God bless you, sister. You're on fire. Pray for me and my daughters. Leila, my daughters keep telling me they want to call me. Pray, Leila. Jesus removes Martin Simon Yaku, who's on Facebook. Get rid of him, Lord, and be a fire in Michelle to shame or to repent. Okay, now with that said, you understand in 1 John 5, 6-8, the oneness there is their unanimous testimony. They agree. Let me give you further proof. Further proof, that's what it is. Okay. Let's read 1 John 5, 9 to 12. 1 John 5, 9 to 12. Right? 1 John 5, 9 to 12. Let's read. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God, you see what the entire context is? Witness, witness. The witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God, which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. Right? And this is the record that God hath given to us, eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life, and he that hath not the Son of God hath not life. So the entire section is about witness. God the Father has borne witness. If you want eternal life, it's in my Son. So you got to believe in my Son, love my Son, trust in my Son, and you'll have that life that's from him. So it's saying the Father bears witness to that. The Son bears witness to that. And the Holy Spirit bears witness to that. That's what it's talking about. They are one in their witness. Why are you asking me the question, Yusuf? It's right there in front of you. Yusuf, brother, are you reading context? 
I hope I'm not confusing you. You get it? So isn't it ironic? Thank you, Navneet. That 1 John 5, 7, which they think is a proof text for the Trinity, is anything but that? It is not referring to the three being one in essence. And ironically, John 10, 30 is a proof text that the Father and Son are one in essence, one in power, one in divinity. And yet that passage, which they cannot deny is genuine, they'll say, no, it doesn't prove that. But this passage, which has nothing to do with their essence, that does prove the Trinity, but it's an interpolation. Isn't it ironic? But you know whose fault it is, folks? It's not the Muslims' fault. It's the false fault of Christian Trinitarians. Why? We Christians don't know our Bible enough. If we knew our Bible enough, we would know 1 John 5, 7, though it's Quoted by many people as proof of the essential unity of the Godhead. Contextually, it's not referring to that. Yes, sir. Hey, Frank, come on in, man. Live stream. How are you, buddy? Hey, guys, sorry. Guys, I'm sorry. We, we got the uh, – I'm doing live stream, but come on in. I just got to let them know what's up. The uh, dryer is not working. What's it doing? Uh, if you put it on, you'll see it's going to make a noise. It's like I think the engine's burned out. The plaster in this bathroom is cracked, and then – the other bathroom, no hot water. Yeah. I know you guys are busy and it's hot, man. Sorry to inconvenience you guys. Guys, this is part of the live stream, folks. Live stream. Even though I'm teaching. Hey, we got guests. Pray for my my, my friends here. Lord Jesus, bless them. All right. As they're checking uh, my, my dryer, we'll keep talking. So you understand in 1 John 5, 7, the fault is with Christians. The fault is with Christians. Not knowing context. I know many of you love First John 5, 7. You need, you, you, need, you need me to help you guys? Or are you okay? You guys want some water, some pop? This one or the other one? That one, the plaster is cracking. But in the other bathroom, no hot water. You guys want some uh, Coke Zero? No, I'm good. Thank you. All right. So the fault is with us Christians. We Christians... Don't know context, don't read context, right? And because we don't read context, we take 1 John 5, 7 out of context to show it is a Trinitarian proof text. In reality, it's not about their essence. I'm not saying the Father, the Word, and the Spirit are not one God. Of course they are. But 1 John 5, 7 is not about their essence. You can say that the reason why they're perfectly united, they perfectly agree, and their testimony is in perfect agreement is because they're one in essence. In other words, the reason why they perfectly agree with one another is because they are one God. Being one God means they'll never disagree. They'll never oppose one another. They'll never be in op opposition. They always agree. They always are united. They cannot disagree and cannot act independently separate from the others. Because being one God, they are inseparable in their actions and in their testimony. But that's not what the passage is saying. The passage is saying they're one in their, one in their witness. Their witness is one. They agree together perfectly. And you can say the reason why they agree perfectly because they're one God. And they can't help but agree. But you'd have to bring in other passages to prove they're one God. The Father and the Son and the Spirit are one God even though they're not the same person. And because they're one God, different persons, they only work in union with one another. They can only work in accord with one another. They can never act independently from one another, which is why their witness will always agree, and perfectly so. Is it making sense now? Yes, Manuel. The Spirit, the blood, and water... Even though John doesn't come out and tell us, most likely you can say the Spirit refers to the Holy Spirit. Let me, let me explain what Spirit, blood, and water represent. If that makes sense, let me unpack 1 John 5, 8. Let's read 6 and 8 together. 1 John 5, 6 and 8. Okay. Amen, first and last. God bless you, brother. Okay, this is... 
he that came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. So pay attention. He came by water and blood, even Jesus Christ. Not by water only, but by water and blood. And it is the spirit that beareth witness because the spirit is truth. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the spirit and the water and the blood. You guys good? I'm going to have to get you another, no, I have to get you another car shirt for that. That's not a okay. car shirt we have. Oh, oh by the way, uh, I forgot. I'm just going to get you another dryer. Oh, so then we don't need to worry about the... Uh, where it catches the uh, okay, that's no, right. we'll get you a brand new one. You're a good man, bro. I'm just gonna get you a brand new one. What's your name, Frank? Do we shake hands because I know people are afraid of COVID? Oh, I'm fine. God bless you, Frank. Let me catch your name again. You're scaring me, man. Stop. I can do this, though, don't, bro. Don't, don't touch me. I can do that, bro. That's right. Be careful, man. You know, I, I'm a virus killer. God bless you guys. You have you yeah. All right, now, hey, yes, yes, buddy. On those tubs, yes, I'm gonna call for the guy because those were just redone right before you moved in. Yeah, he didn't do a good job, did he? No, shitty job. But you'll, you'll need to leave for like six, four, six hours. I'm, I'm planning on going to California. No, I'll go in. No, I'm just kidding. I'll go whenever you want. I'm just playing. It's closed. You okay, can't go. Okay, then you tell me. I'm open. Go. We're open anytime. Okay, We're free. I'll, I'll let you know. Thank you, brother. God bless you. All right. Now, good guy. Sorry. Hey, this is it. I'm as transparent, as real as you can get, right? I've let you in my home. What else? It's like I'm Mr. Rogers. You're in my home, right? Mr. Rogers' neighborhood, bring you into my house, introduce you to my friends. If I could, I'd even let you eat my food, right? Right? It's a good uh, feeling, right? How does that song go, Mr. Rogers? Man, I forgot it, right? I'll be back when the day is new, and I'll have more ideas for you. You'll have things that you'll want to talk about. All right, anyway. Mr. Shamoon's neighborhood. Hey, neighbor. How are you doing? Hey, neighbor, how are you doing? All right, now, with that said, okay, you see it says, water, Anna, do you think I can control myself from touching my face? Don't touch your face. All right, I'm just going to, when my face itches, I'm just going to use my tongue. Come on, man. Okay. All right, now, coming back to the issue. Coming back to the issue. It says, the spirit and the water and the blood. Now, John doesn't come out and tell us what exactly he means. So there are two possible interpretations. Are you guys now want to know what the spirit, the water, and the blood refer to? Samuel, I've done sessions on that. Samuel Schlegge, and I have an article on that, that Jesus is the true God and eternal life. Okay. It can refer to the fact that on earth, when Jesus got baptized by water, right? Mm -hmm. The Spirit came down visibly, and the blood refers to the blood of the cross and the miracles that took place on the cross. So by Spirit, water, and blood, it can refer to the Holy Spirit manifesting visibly as a dove when he was baptized and the miraculous things that took place on the cross, right? So it can refer to the Holy Spirit, his baptism, and his death on the cross where his blood was shed. You with me there? Or it can refer to what happened in John 19, verse 34, when they pierced his side and a flow of blood and water came out, which was the witness of the Spirit that this man was no ordinary man and his death was no ordinary death. But it is referring to events on earth. Most likely, it's the water baptism of Jesus and his death on the cross, which the Spirit used to confirm who Jesus is. Because after all, don't forget that at the cross, miraculous things transpired to the point that one of the criminals ended up coming to faith because of what he saw taking place on the cross. And he realized by the Spirit using the signs to help him realize that this Jesus is no criminal. And even the soldiers, the, the centurion, when Jesus died, the way he died, they concluded this man was a righteous man, the son of God. You mean there? So now here's the question. In the context of 1 John 5, 7, is it talking about them being one in essence or united in their testimony? All of that, Errol, yes, all of that. The blood refers to the blood he shed on the cross, which cleanses us of our sin. The water would refer to water baptism. If it's not referring to the blood and water that came out of his side, either interpretation makes sense contextually because it's talking about 
God bearing witness on earth to Jesus' divine identity, right? It's not about God bearing witness on earth to who Jesus was and why he did what he did. Because he says earthly witnesses. And those earthly witnesses was a manifestation of the heavenly witnesses, meaning the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit gave proof of who Jesus is by the miracles and the signs that occurred on earth. Right? Everyone getting it? And after all, didn't the Father's voice, didn't they hear the Father's voice audibly? Even the, the heavenly witnesses manifested on earth. For example, when Jesus came out of the waters, the Spirit appeared in bodily shape as a dove, so he, he was seen visibly, and the Father's voice was heard audibly. This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So the three heavenly witnesses testified that Jesus is the Son in whom there is life, and you need to believe in him, by the signs and miracles that took place on earth during his ministry. Signs that even include the Father speaking audibly, the Holy Spirit appearing visibly, and working in union with Son, doing the miracles in union with the Son to show this is God's unique Son. You need to believe in him if you want to have, have life. And the Father's voice wasn't just heard audibly at baptism. It was also heard on the Mount of Transfiguration. If you go to Mark 9, verses 1 to 7, Matthew 16, verse 28, to 17, verse 5, chapter 17, verse 5, 1 to 5, and Luke 9, 27 to 35, there you'll see the disciples, Peter, James, and John, went with Jesus on a high mountain. He was transfigured before them, became dazzling white, his face shone like the sun. Moses and Elijah appear, and they saw the cloud come down upon them. And then the Father's voice speaking to the cloud, saying to them, This is my beloved Son. Listen to him. And again, the Father's voice was heard in John 12, 28 to 30, where the crowd heard a voice audibly, audibly like you're hearing my voice from heaven. John 12, 28 to 30. Let's post that. John 12, 28 to 30. Right? So good crowd today. We had about 100, 225, although we're going down still. That's better than before. And I pray it increases in Jesus' name. Okay, now let's look. John 12, 28 to 30. Father, glorify thy name. Then came, came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it and will glorify it again. The people, therefore, that stood by and heard it said, that it thundered, and others said, an angel spake to him. Jesus answered and said, this voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. So they heard an audible voice. The Father's, now guys, you understand the power and the authority that Jesus has? Whatever Jesus asks of the Father, the Father immediately does it. That's how much the Father is in love with Jesus. And that's how quick the Father is to do whatever Jesus demands. So he said, Father, glorify your name immediately. He spoke audibly to bear witness of who his son is. Right? Don't you wish you had that kind of authority? That you ask the Father of something and he does it immediately? So with that said, did you learn how not to argue with the Muslim and anti-Trinitarian regarding 1 John 5, 7 and how to argue against the anti-Trinitarian when they bring up 1 John 5 or 7. Did you learn? I don't know, Kenneth. We'll see, brother. Let's see. Did you learn how not to and how to address the issue of 1 John 5, 7? Everyone got it? Because I'm going to end it with an even more powerful proof text for the Trinity. 1 John 5, 7 is not about the essential unity of the Godhead. Is that clear? Is that clear? 1 John 5, verse 7 is not talking about the Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit are one in essence. The context is about they are united in their witness. 
right? You're not only armed through the session, King of Kings. I gave you five articles, five articles where I discussed this in depth thoroughly. 1611, you got it too, my brother? How not to use that passage and how to argue your position? I'm not really interested in the Quran in this session, but we'll see. Now, let's end it with a powerful. Yes, who is it? Hello? Hey, brother, come on. Hey, just real quick. Yes. You're going to be here at 7 o'clock today, the repairs in the tub. Today? Tomorrow morning. Okay. In the morning? In the morning. Okay. So you might have to be gone for like yes. an hour. And then in the afternoon, they're going to replace that valve. I'll tell them. All right. Cool. Oh, I got it. Thank you, brother. Sorry. You know, that, that scared the heck out of me, guys. You know why that scared the heck out of me? Can I tell you why? I'm on the run. I thought it's maybe from Illinois. The judge sent people to arrest me. Pray Jesus deals with that judge, removes her, and never, never gets near me. Okay? So I freaked out. I'm like, uh-oh, I'm going to be preaching from a jail cell. <laughs> All right. Now let me give you, hey, guys, even though I can't stand the way I look and the way I sound, especially you sisters, especially you, you're single who love the Lord. And I don't want you to lie. You got to admit, I am good looking. Am I? Am I handsome enough? What do you think? Anyway, now, Matthew 28. By the way, Antonoli, I'm not joking, though. There is some truth in what I said. In Jesus' name, Lisa, I won't go. And Jesus is going to remove the judge and Martin and humble Michelle, my ex-wife, to stop hurting my daughters. Okay, now, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. See, I'm trying to play on the sentiments of my sisters in the Lord who are single because they're Christians. They don't want to hurt my feeling, but they know they can't lie. Oh, Sam. And they don't answer. Did you catch it? They don't want to lie. Oh, Sam. <laughs> the little snakes. All right. Now, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Are we ready? I got issues, man. Let's read, folks. Here is a passage that's even more powerful in demonstrating the Trinity than 1 John 5, 7. Poor Protestant has been posting it more than once. Let's do it a final time. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Like Protestant, like, man, I'm tired, folks. Not only I don't get paid for this, I got to do thumbnails and I got to work. Because first last just sits there and looks pretty. All right, now let's read. Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Then the 11 disciples went away into Galilee, into a mountain where Jesus had appointed. Now, guys, pay attention how to unpack this. This is the passage that points to the triunity of God. Don't let any anti-Trinitarians tell you otherwise. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. The doubt would have to be whether he was really alive in the flesh or were they simply hallucinating. But then Jesus assuages their doubts and then confirms that worshipping him is the appropriate response. Because now notice in 18. And Jesus came and spake unto him, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. I'm going to unpack verses 19 and 20. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Let's unpack this. Let's unpack this. Jesus says, baptize them in the name, singular, name, not names. One name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Now, anti-Trinitarians, especially Muslims, say it doesn't mean they're God. Okay. Here's what you ask a Muslim. Are you ready now? Ask the Muslim, can you say in the name of Allah and his messenger and Gabriel? Say that. I'm going to record you or write it out because I'm going to post it on social media. I want you to say in the name of Allah and of, of the messenger and of Gabriel. Say that. They won't. Say in the name of Allah and of Muhammad and of the Holy Spirit. Say that. They won't say it. You know why? Because they know you can't take the name of God, which represents his essence and characteristics, and then distribute that name to others who are creatures. You can't say in the name of Allah and of the messenger and of Gabriel. You can't say in the name of Allah and of Muhammad and of the Holy Spirit. You can't say that. You catch it? 
No, he doesn't swear by other names, George Wagner. No, you won't say by that. He says, by your Lord, by the mountain. That's different. Okay, so understand how to use Matthew 28, 19. So I'm challenging you and I'm recording you because I want to put it on social media or write it out. Say, in the name of Allah and of Muhammad and of Gabriel. Or say, in the name of Allah and of the messenger and of the Holy Spirit. Because they believe the Holy Spirit is Gabriel. They won't say it because they know it's blasphemy. Then how can the Muslim Isa, Jesus, say, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit? He can't if he's a Muslim. And the reason why it's singular, because here Jesus is showing you that the name of the Father is the name of the Son and the name of the Holy Spirit. Now, what does name mean in the biblical context? Don't take my word for it. Look up any lexicon. Anoma or Anoma. The word there means the authority, the nature, and or characteristics of someone or something. So when you say in the name of the Father and the Son of the Spirit, you're saying the authority that the Father, Son, Holy Spirit possess in common. Right? Third point. Third point. I think this is the third point. Okay. You ask the anti-Trinitarian. Now, the Muslim doesn't have a problem with this, but a Jehovah's Witness would. Is the Father a person? They'll say yes. Is the Son a person? They'll say yes. But is the Holy Spirit a person? There are some groups that say Holy Spirit is not a person. So you're telling me an impersonal force is grouped with two persons and shares the name that the two persons share, even though he's not a person. So in the name of the Father and the Son and an impersonal force, why would an impersonal force have a name? And why would an impersonal force be grouped with two other persons and share a common name with two persons when, according to you, the Holy Spirit is not a person? Do you see the problem? Do you understand how you now refute the fact that the Spirit has to be a person? Because you don't speak of the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit if the two are persons but the one is impersonal. Why would you ascribe the name of two persons that they possess in common with an impersonal force? Is that making sense? And now finally, finally, to prove that this is a powerful witness to the triunity of God and Jesus is the God-man. Jesus is the God-man. Matthew 28, 20. Let's read it again. Matthew 28, 20. And I got to call it a night because I got to get ready for the live stream in two hours. So I got to be ready. Okay, Jesus says in Matthew 28, 20, watch. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Now notice what Jesus said. The context is the Great Commission. I'm sending you out throughout the world so that you can make disciples and bring them under the authority and the headship of the Father and the Son and Holy Spirit. And then he gives them a promise and assurance. He gives them a promise and an assurance. And this is what he assures them. Hello. We're almost done. Ten minutes. Good. No, I'm, I'm finished. Sorry. Because I got to go live in a couple hours. Okay, here's the assurance. I am with you to guarantee the success of your mission. I am with you to make sure that you will succeed in making disciples of all nations. And no one will stop you from accomplishing my command of making disciples of all nations. That's the context. He's guaranteeing them. He's assuring them. I'm with all of you in your mission to make disciples of all nations. So don't be afraid. You will not fail. I guarantee the success of your mission because I'm going to back you up. Okay, now here's my question. What kind of attributes must Jesus have in order to guarantee that no matter how many disciples there are, no matter where they're, they, they're at, He'll be with them personally. He's not with them physically. In his physical body, he's in heaven. He'll be with them personally to make sure they succeed and no one stops them from fulfilling his will. He must be omniscient because he, mu he must know who they are. He must be omnipresent because he must be with all of them. 
and he must be omnipotent. He must be powerful enough to guarantee that no one will stop them, which means there can't be no power equal to his, let alone greater than his. So here Jesus is claiming to be the omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent God. You caught it? And now the icing on the cake. The icing on the cake. Sorry, do you guys hear the air condition in the background? Hope it's not going to distract you. The icing on the cake. Matthew 28, 20 ends the way Matthew 1 begins. Matthew 28, 20 ends the way Matthew chapter 1 begins. Let me show you what I mean. Let's post Matthew 28, 20 with Matthew 1, 22 to 23 back to back. Matthew 28, 20. With Matthew 1, 22, 23, back to back. Guys, read. Read. Matthew 1, 22, 23, back to back. With Matthew 28, 20. Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. I am with you always. Matthew 1, 22 to 23. Can you hear that too in the background? I said 122, 23 plus 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. Guys, you got to get the connection. Got to get the connection. Matthew ends with Jesus saying, I am with you always. But then he began, Matthew 1, by saying, Mary, the blessed virgin, conceived as a virgin, gives birth as a virgin by the power of the Holy Spirit to a son, and his name is Emmanuel. Why is he Emmanuel? Because he's God with us. So Matthew begins the gospel by saying, Jesus is God with us. And then ends the gospel by having Jesus say, I remain with you. In other words, the proclamation of Matthew is Jesus is the God of heaven who comes to dwell with us. And that God says at the end of the gospel, I will remain with you till the very end. But here's what's most amazing about Matthew 1 23. Do you know what the Greek word? Do you know what the Greek word is for God? It's ha theos. Literally, the Greek says that the child born is ha theos, the God, not a God who comes to dwell with us. Here it goes. Okay, let me show you. Right here. Here's the Greek. Click on it. The Greek says that the child born is. Ha Theos, the God who comes to dwell with us. In other words, Matthew begins and ends the gospel by affirming Jesus is the virgin born son who is the God, Ha Theos, not a God, who comes to dwell and remain with us. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. That's your Trinity right there. And that's your proof that Jesus is the God man. He's alive. He is risen. He's almighty to save. And we pray Jesus keeps us in love with him. Seals us by his spirit, washes us in his blood, and my daughters, wash them, Lord Jesus, provide for us, provide for them, keep us in love with you, and come sooner than later, modern Atha. We love you, Lord Jesus. We love you. Guys, pray for my daughters, pray for me, pray for my health and their health, pray for our provision, and pray for our holiness. Lord willing, I'll be on in two hours with David Wood, God willing, and tomorrow, Lord willing, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. I'll be on talking about being born again. Love you guys. I hope you're blessed. Re-listen to this. Hit the like button, subscribe, and invite more people. Christ is risen, risen indeed. We love you, Lord Jesus.